All right, guys, it's another episode of Fitter Body, Stronger Mind. With me, Cameron from Theseus Body and Mind. We've got Stephen Whitney here today. Super excited about this episode. We're talking about breath how to breathe for optimum performance, for healthier living. Steve is, I'll let Steve introduce himself properly, but to give you a quick overview, um, he's a master breathwork instructor for Soma, very uh, fast growing company uh, in the breathwork space, doing all sorts of exciting stuff. I met him on a fitness journey of mine in Thailand. Uh, when I was doing a bit of yoga out there, he was he came in to do a bit of pranayama with us, with us there, which I'll, we can, I'm sure we can talk about a little bit more as well. So, Steve, why don't you introduce yourself, talk about what you're up to, and whatever else you feel like. <laughs> oh, right on, Cameron. Well, thank you so much for the intro, man. I really appreciate it. And, yeah, I'm incredibly excited to be here. So, uh, me, myself, I mean, it's just, it's been a wild ride. So, for the last three years, um, I lived corporate America lifestyle and had the corporate job, um, all the bells and whistles, and also a heavy drinking problem. So, um, like you were saying, you had a, a fitness journey and I went on a healing journey to get out of my depression, uh, addiction issues, my uh, heavy weight gain that I had uh, incorporated. And um, yeah, it's been a wild story. So literally now I have been able to heal all of those things. I found my purpose. I found my passion, which is pranayama, breathing and breath control and all of the different facets that can be applied to your mental health, emotional health, physical health. And, uh, and that's what I teach now. So I am a, uh, a coach for Soma Breath. I'm one of their master instructors. And yeah, it's just, uh, again, amazing to be here. And I'm really excited to, uh, to share some of the knowledge that's been passed down for millennia. It's, you know, thousands of years that's now been passed down mm -hmm. to me. And uh, I feel like it's my purpose to make sure that I pass this information along to others. So I'm excited to have a chat with you and anyone else that's watching. This is going to be a fun talk. Yeah, absolutely is, man. And um, for all the reasons that you just listed, you know, uh, so I mean, I was really excited to, to get you on here because for me personally, you know, I've been, you know, I've been a qualified fitness professional for over a decade, but I only really started paying uh, as much attention as as it deserves to things like breath work, uh, mindfulness practices within the last few years, really. You know, I, I played around with a little bit of Wim Hof um, breathing techniques, things like that before I, before I met you, just, just before I met you within that kind of 12 months before then. Um, and it was always something that I was aware of. I was aware of emerging science coming out to back it up. I was aware of people doing it and reporting great, you know, benefits, but it was just something that never came into my kind of weekly regime, you know, fitness was always there, but that stuff was always kind of on the back seat. Uh, and then it wasn't until I, I got to Thailand, um, you know, started doing the yoga, which obviously encompasses all these other things. It's kind of the way I describe it now is like the glue that kind of holds everything else together in health and fitness. You've got the breath work, you've got the mindfulness, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, I started experiencing all these things and realizing that there's so much in this stuff and it is ancient wisdom, but it but it is wisdom, you know. There's, there's masses of of science now, modern Western science that's backing stuff up, that's made it really interesting to even the most kind of pragmatic, you know, non-spiritual um, practitioner in the, in the Western world who's looking to increase health, increase happiness, increase performance work and stuff. Uh, and then as I've evolved into a performance coach rather than a fitness coach, I've realized the huge benefits that it's been able to um, to have on, on the people that I've worked with, recommending different breathwork techniques, examining them more, doing more research into the, into the science. And it's just become apparent to me how, how hugely important this aspect is. And I, I really, I mean, I don't wish anything was different about my past ever because that, I don't think that's very productive, you know, constructive, but <laughs> it, it would have been nice if I'd been interested in this a bit more, a bit earlier, because it's just so, so hugely beneficial. So no, I, um, I there's probably. I'm always like, man, if my parents would have only taught me this when I was a kid, I wonder where I'd be now. Not to reflect on the past, but no, I, I share that with you. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I'm sure there's quite a few people who will be listening to this who, who probably aren't practicing any kind of breath work already, never really paid any more attention to their breathing than just, you know, as much as we the majority of us do, which is just making sure it's, it's happening. <laughs> um, so, 
so maybe we can start off by talking a little bit about specifically what SOMA is, what the practices involve, maybe what makes it different to some of the other stuff that people might have heard of. Um, just to give an idea of what you're actually kind of doing. But when people hear the term breath work, I think they really quite often have no idea what all that entails. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and there's a, some reasons why, and that's because pranayama has been really um, altered and in a lot of ways Americanized. And when you start to dilute the solution, you water it down, the more you water it down, it loses its original authenticity and, and its core purpose. And this is the really cool thing about Soma and why I resonated with them so, so very much is because there is science backing on all of it. And the founder, it's quite amazing. He was a pharmacist. And so he has a chemistry um, you know, degree and he loves science. And I didn't grow up having any interest in science, but when I started to dive into pranayama and was able to correlate the mystic side of things with the new age modern science and merge the two together that brought a deeper um why this magical word and guys th this word is something i use a lot because if you're ever lost or confused you feel like you're stuck you can always return back to this one simple word of why and if you have a why then it's really going to help you out in your life but for me i was lost i was depressed i was actually borderline suicidal and I needed to, to have some form of why. And so it was really cool to get the mystic side, the ancient text in the Rig Veda, the most ancient manuscript, um, to hear how they spoke of Soma as a different form of something outside of pranayama, but then also to take what modern day science has done and merge the two together. And it's amazing how the ancient rishis knew how to use their breathing and breath control to reach ecstatic states, to optimize their um, their physiology, their mental health, to be able to reach expanded, altered states of consciousness where they were gaining wisdom and knowledge. And when you tap into pranayama or um, your prana, which is your life force energy, you know, your breath is your life force. Without breath, there is no life. And so we have overlooked a lot of the, um, the importance of having conscious awareness of breath. And this is a really cool thing about Soma and what differentiates it from any other modality is the technique itself, um, which I can talk about here uh, momentarily, but also that it's teaching you why. Why is it that this happens when you breathe in through your nose? Why is it that this happens when you change this rhythm of breathing, when you hold your breath in or out? And the breath find that there's a different series of actions and reactions that you can actually create to your biochemistry, your neurology, your physiology. And, and this to me was the ultimate biohacking tool. Uh, but again, in a lot of, uh, a lot of modalities, they just tell you, this is going to detox your lymphatic system. This is going to, mm -hmm. this will cleanse your kidneys. Why? Why? Yeah. You know, and, and no one has anything to back it. And so Soma has spent uh, many, many, many years putting together this information to bridge the gap between mysticism and modern day science. And that is really what differentiates the kind of the mission or, or the overlooking circle in uh, what I see as a differentiator between Soma and other breathwork modalities, excluding the actual technique itself. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's a big problem with this stuff is that, you know, I mean, firstly, I like what you say about having having a why, you know, and I, I can I sort of translate that same principle almost into into various different things. It's like Gaz is going to pop into uh, the, the meeting with us. Perfect. Hi, Gaz. Thanks for joining. <laughs> So yeah, I like I like that um, that point about asking the why, and that's I, I like to translate that as well to to why we dismiss things, because what I've come to realise is that we quite often just mug this stuff off a lot of the time because it's unfamiliar. You know, we we're quite scared of things that are unfamiliar, um, especially when it's sort of dressed up in quite flowery ancient language that we also don't really understand, uh, and you know, the more pragmatic kind of Western. Uh, side of culture tends to tends to turn a blind eye to those things they don't want to be seen as doing something that's kind of weird um, don't want to be made to look an idiot by participating in something you don't really understand uh, and so it is quite important to be able to 
translate to somebody, you know, the actual kind of hard facts about why this helps. Uh, and, and that is a problem, like I was kind of coming on to say, that when you go to sort of yoga even, or, you know, various different things, um, quite often the practitioners themselves don't un really understand the science behind it. It's just, you know, they're running off pure belief and, and the fact that they participated in it and, and received the benefits. But until that point where you've uh, somebody has had that opportunity to, to receive the benefits and see the outcomes, you know, you need to give them that little reassurance to say, look, this does actually work. You know, it is thousands of years old and it, and it is, you know, it does sound kind of funny. It does have funny names, but also there's a randomized controlled trial here that shows <laughs> such and such an outcome. <laughs> so, you know, um, and, and I think that's fair enough for people to, to kind of require that knowledge to, to make that step across the, the, kind of gap of unfamiliarity um, in order to kind of give these things a go in the first place. So it's really, yeah, it's really important well, that you're able to back this stuff up. And think about how many things, not just breathing, but like how many things, I hate to, to say the topics, but that have been, um, that are dogmatic. They have been adjusted. Mm -hmm. People have put their own twist on it. The origins of a lot of religion, um, knowledge, mm -hmm. information has all become um, dogmatic. And so people have twisted it and altered it. And because of this, it's actually pushed a lot of people away because they don't believe it. It doesn't make sense. They don't believe it. It's too crazy. But again, it's that, that, um, that watering down effect. And so again, having, um, bridging that gap between the two, I think is crucial because people need to know this information, but they don't need to be afraid of it. And, uh, and that's one thing that Soma's done is they've removed the dogma. This is just the raw stuff here, but they also we provide you with the information of what the ancients were saying, what they were doing, but now how modern day. So it's not about one or the other, it's not one is right, one is wrong. Um, as human beings, I feel like we deserve to know all the information and you as a human being, anyone watching this can, you know, gather your own um, opinion or belief from that, you know? Yeah, great, great point. Yeah, and, and that's almost the flip side of it as well, is that we we also have got to a point in modern science, I think, where we're really dismissive of sort of observational research, um, you know, historical research. We're always looking, we've considered, considered the randomized control trial now to be the gold standard of, you know, scientific uh, study. And so we kind of mug off everything else, even though if you look at the historical data, we're probably one of the first um, huge populations throughout history that do not practice on a mass scale some kind of conscious breathing uh, exercise as part of our culture. <laughs> you know, so actually, when you look back and go, well, actually, you know, all these past civilizations, all these populations, and more kind of indigenous um, areas still are, like we're always practicing this, we're always doing this. There's got to be something in that. Um, but yeah, again, because it becomes unfamiliar, it falls out of sync with cultural tradition. We tend to kind of mug it off. We can't see a randomized control trial. It doesn't count. Yeah. So yeah, all interesting. Um, could you maybe give us an example, Steve, of uh, the kind of practices that you actually teach at, uh, through Sober? Kind of what sort of techniques would you get start people started with there? And are they, are they wide ranging or does it tend to be uh, a particular set of techniques that you stick to? Um, it really, really ranges. And it's hard for me to say one or the other because I'm a firm believer that if I tell you this one thing is going to work, then I'm not doing you any justice. It's a lie. Not one diet works for everyone. Not one fitness routine works for everyone. Same thing. Um, it depends on where that person's at. If they're heavily stressed out and they're dealing with adrenal fatigue and burnout, then there is a much different breathing technique that I'm going to use for that person because it's all about bringing the physiology back into alignment. And so anytime that you're dealing with um, anything that is disrupting your peak performance, so whether it's your sleep, your mental clarity, your health, if you're having disease in the body, um, most all diseases that are generated and created in the body are just coming from an imbalance to the physiology. And the mind and the body are connected. So it's not just the body. It's also the mind and the body and the mind and body connection. So it, it really depends on each person. But um, one thing that I find to be incredibly important for absolutely every single person is to be conscious of your daily breathing. 
And there is a big misconception when people think of breathing. You hear from everyone that you need to breathe more. Breathe deep, breathe more, oxygen is gonna keep you alive. And it, it's actually quite the opposite. Yes, don't get me wrong, you do need oxygen to, to live, right? But it's quite the opposite in regards that in pranayama, the less you breathe, the longer you live. So it's about slowing down your breath, having breath control, because oxygen is actually the silent killer to your cells. This is, oxy this is what creates oxidative stress, um, respiratory alkalosis. These, this is the deterioration of your cellular structure due to an abundance of an increase in too much oxygen. Oxygen creates contraction. Carbon dioxide creates expansion. It's literally that easy. Inhale, contract, exhale, expand. And so anyone that's listening in just to start is to extend your exhale. Make your exhale longer than your inhale. That's one of the best things that I can tell anyone, um, regardless of where, what state you're in whether you're into fitness, you're um, dealing with fatigue, sleep issues, uh, mental clarity problems, brain fog, it doesn't matter. Extending your exhale is crucial to um, balancing CO2 levels, and that's how you use oxygen efficiently. And we really wanna focus, and the, the big thing that I try and bring awareness to and what I teach is all about oxygen efficiency. It's about becoming efficient in how you produce energy and oxygen equals energy. So your oxygen intake is crucial to your health and your longevity. The other component on this though, that you guys need to be aware of is breathing in a rhythm is another crucial component. So erratic breathing leads to erratic thoughts. Erratic thoughts lead to erratic emotions and your emotional state is basically how you view and perceive the world around you. So breathing in a rhythm will allow your physiology and your biochemistry, everything to be in rhythm. Okay, when your breath is in rhythm, then so are all of the rhythms in your body. Your entire body works off of rhythms, just like nature works off of rhythms. Our body works off of rhythms. So breathing in a rhythm. So this would be like, for example, breathing in for a count of two, in, two, and out for a count of four. This is a perfect way to become parasympathetic, to relax, to slow down the rate of oxygen you're inhaling and start to increase the CO2 in your bloodstream. And this has a cascade of amazing health effects. So in interesting, three, yeah. Four, in, two, out, two, three, four. In through the nose and out through the mouth. Or in through the nose mm. and out through the nose. That's fine as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Very interesting. So yeah, that's, that's very common. Uh, not so much to misnomer, but not necessarily kind of the totally accurate perception of, of the truth that you're talking about there with um, yeah, everybody's got this idea that we're just trying to get in more oxygen, but actually breathing is as much about removing carbon dioxide from the body. Carbon dioxide also plays a huge role. Carbon dioxide gets this really bad rap for being kind of like the, the thing that we just really don't want because we're breathing it out, but carbon dioxide is still critical to many bodily functions. People don't realize that that it does play a role. And there's a, I've noticed that there's companies that are bringing out carbon dioxide generators now to keep in the home to use strategically. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what they're marketing wait, wait, is, wait. but I just- This yeah. isn't like plugging a hose into an exhaust pipe and putting it in your house. Yeah. Like, yeah. Your Anyone listening to this, do yeah. not do that. That's carbon <laughs> monoxide, okay? <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We definitely, definitely avoid the confusion there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's funny, go ahead. Yeah, that was pr pretty much it. I just like I like the point that you said there that uh, you know it's not just about bringing oxygen in. It's not just about the oxygen factor. It's about managing the carbon dioxide, managing the body's response to it. You know the amounts at present and, and this kind of stuff. I'm sure Gaz be interested to add uh, some stuff into the mix on, on that uh, leading up. Being uh, it was just um, you know the, the immediate thing that comes to mind there is part of the mechanisms of fatigue when you train hard. Um, you know, when people lose their breath, in that instance, you know, when you're breathing heavy, most of it isn't about getting oxygen in. It's actually about getting the waste products out. The, the, uh, you know, when you're, when you're really fatigued. So, so, you know, not, how can I put it, to confuse people and be contrarian, you know, obviously there is a balance. But normally that balance, if you start doing anything that's hard and anaerobic, your willingness to breathe heavy is actually more about getting CO, um, you know, much as it is, you know, 
getting oxygen in, a little more so in fact, because especially in anaerobic activity, it builds up very, 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 very quickly. And, you know, you, you, in terms of that metabolic process, get, get that out to, to keep going. Uh, most, of, most of fatigue is based around, you know, to not go in too heavy because the tendency would be to not go confused about waste products. It's about getting waste good products out buffering waste products so just in saying that um, talking about your mental state of perceptions even a simple logical perception of what is going on will often change how you physiologically react to something so say for example if I'm training physically hard and my perception is I need to get more oxygen in it will probably ever, ever so slightly and subtly change the, the rhythm in which you are breathing because you're focused on getting something in. Whereas if you focus on getting something out, even if you're unaware of it, you will actually start moving and thinking and breathing differently, <laughs> if that makes sense. And so, you know, if, if you understand that process, for me, um, my... my breathwork experience has actually been limited to the practice of free diving but I also have a degree in physiology and I understand that every time I respire and expire there's it's a bit like what goes up must come down if something goes up there's a point where it almost imperceptibly stop and then comes down again and that for me is the gaseous exchange that's the exchange of gases across the membrane of the lungs and into the bloodstream. Knowing that, I, I've caught myself without even consciously thinking about it. As I breathe, I almost pause and let it just, I let myself, um, I don't have an active release. I don't push anything out. I pause and almost let the weight of gravity let it come out. And for me, in my mind, that's giving that my body that chance to have that gaseous exchange, to get you know, to extract uh, oxygen from the air I breathe in and allow the, <laughs> that carbon dioxide to dissolve, you know, across those, those membranes. And this out. is interesting that you're saying this because with your background, yes, you're, you're focusing on releasing the gases, but as you take that oxygen in, that, that brief period of pause that you're speaking of, that you're then allowing that gas to leave, right? Well, I actually believe in the opposite, not believe the research that I've done is the opposite. Um, carbon dioxide is the activant that releases oxygen off the red blood cell. When the hemoglobin attaches the oxygen to the red blood cell, um, it will not release off that red blood cell without proper CO2 levels. So if you're constantly breathing out all of these gases, then you're missing out on a crucial component to health. And that's actually allowing the oxygen to release off the red blood cell and enter into the other cells, the other organs, muscles, and tissues. And you can't do that without proper carbon dioxide levels. So if yeah. you guys are shallow breathing or breathing too much, especially in fitness, you're breathing out all the gases, but that means that you don't have proper CO2 levels in your bloodstream. And this is what creates oxidative stress and fatigue. This is what creates fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. I was, maybe I didn't, um, yeah, are we on this? Maybe I, maybe I misinterpreted what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so like, uh, for example, uh, I know from physiology that my the stimuli for me to uh, breathe is actually caused essentially by the presence of carbon dioxide, as opposed to, so for example, if I was to do lots of uh, hyperventilating, um, I would become dizzy. I would become over oxygenated mm -hmm. and to bring my normal breathing rhythm back i would actually have to pause get that stimuli from you know the chemo receptors wherever in my brain speaking to my you know my my uh understanding my o2 co2 uh mix in my blood and it's the fact that co2 is present that will stimulate me to want to breathe to, to, to or to breathe heavier um, so I was trying to basically say the same thing, but it's obviously come across 
wrong. <laughs> no, no, brother. It's it's cool. It's a really complex uh, topic, really. And I love what you just said because this is another huge misconception, and um, that people I feel like it's important for people to know. So another really important thing in pranayama is actually holding your breath consciously, doing it unconsciously has negative effects, but consciously. But when you remove all the air from your lungs, a full exhale, okay, all the oxygen you remove and you hold. Well, you're going to get this urge to breathe, this panic sensation, and it's not um, a lack of oxygen that makes you want to have to breathe again. It's actually a buildup of CO2 levels. Mm -hmm. CO2 triggers the nervous system to want to have to breathe. And so this is interesting that you said that because that buildup of CO2, that's what's making you want to have to breathe. So again, yeah. just bringing awareness to these little things and how they actually trigger the body to have these responses is quite an interesting thing. I think it's important for the people to know in any facet of their life, whether it's fitness or emotional health. You know, so I think it was really, really spot on that you said that. Well, one of the things I find really fascinating, um, sort of just to, to add to, it, I'd love to get your your thoughts on it, is the mm -hmm. mammalian dive reflex. I don't know if you're familiar with this. I'm sorry, say that again. The mammalian dive reflex. Mm -hmm. So when you enter different uh, pressure zones, if you were to go down underwater, uh, humans have the mammalian dive reflex. And you will find the deeper you go down, the less of an urge, basically the longer you can hold your breath. Because, you know, say at um, you know, sea level, you know, your lungs are, sorry, I'm trying to fit it in the camera, you know, of X <laughs> volume. But as the pressure comes on, they actually come down. And there's this strange and curious reflex whereby the deeper you go, essentially the less out of breath you feel. So it's almost you can hold your breath for longer the deeper down you are. And as you start to come up, you often get to, I don't want to, you know, I'm not the experts in this. I think it's seven meters. Seven meters is known as the blackout zone. And I think it's normally around sort of 12 meters where things start to change. So you, you'll find you feel fine, you feel fine, you feel fine. And you start coming up and suddenly you feel out of breath. And you've got these last few meters to go. I've always been curious. It, it sounds like you, you may or may not have the answer as to what's actually happening uh, at that point. Yeah, I mean, I honestly, I can't give you a heavily educated answer. I really, really can't. Um, just off the top of my head, I'm curious if that has something to do with pressure. So like, as you were saying, the farther you go down, the more pressure, whoops, the more, there you go. <laughs> the more pressure that's being put on. Well, bringing the sponge, okay? And so oxygen is then uh, being absorbed into your lungs, right? You, you go, you hold your breath, you go down. And as you squeeze, that oxygen is being pushed. So what you're doing is you're pushing that oxygen um, into the other parts of the body. And that oxygen is what's making it thrive. It has the nutrients that it needs. And then as you come up, what happens is there's no more oxygen in your bloodstream. And, um, and now there's this trigger to breathe. But to be honest, I, I really don't know. This is just me kind of shooting off on a whim. No. Um, and actually, I'm surprised I don't because I have a, a, a scuba diving background. And um, yes, an interesting question. I'll have to look into this, man. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting question. It looks like none of us know the answer, so we definitely need to do our homework. <laughs> but uh, creative. Question. Yeah, that, that is that's a really interesting question. I mean, I'm glad you brought up free diving, though, guys, because that's um, you know that's a great or diving in general. I mean, that's a great example of um, you know where this would obviously benefit physical recreation or. Sport sports recreation and I think a lot of the science has come out of free diving you've got um, a guy called James Nestor who's just written a book recently called breathe I think it's just called breathe um, you, you may, you've probably heard of him uh, Steve yeah and uh, so he, he's actually a journalist but he's also a free diver um, so his, his background was I think he was running free diving courses I don't want to tell um, you know inaccurate <laughs> stories now but uh, but yeah he's um yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of the science that so I mean that's his natural evolution. He's gone from free diving into okay, so breath is obviously super important for various different things because obviously part of free diving as well isn't just how much air you can fit in your lungs or how well you can deal with that carbon uh, dioxide buildup, but it's also about staying calm as you yeah. put it 
absolutely appropriately, Stephen. Yeah, it's oxygen efficiency as much as anything, and and maintaining that mental state where you're able to stay relaxed, you know, and not uh, allow the body to work any harder than it needs to, is a massive part of that. So free diving is is kind of huge about the 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 breath control side of things for the for the physiological responses to that, but then also the mindfulness and everything that goes hand in hand with that as well. Um, and anyway, this guy James Nessie, he's kind of travelled the world interviewing all these different, um, yeah, immersing himself in these different cultures, ancient ancient cultures that practice these different things. And then he's come back and written a, uh, a book about them, which is which is really interesting. But the, the point I was going on to is, it's interest, an interesting panel we have here because Gaz has almost undoubtedly got his, his sportsman's head fully engaged in, in this conversation. I'm kind of somewhere in between that and um, kind of cognition, you know, cognitive function, like how we can use it to learn and uh, and focus at work. Uh, and I'm interested to hear from you, Steve, uh, because the benefits are, you know, numerous and, and there's loads of them. And if you go onto the SOMA website and talk about all the things that, that you know, it claims that this can uh, have an advantage on for you, you know, the list is, is pretty long. But I'm interested to know what the kind of main things are that you end up dealing with, with clients that come to you so more with clients that come to you privately is it sports performance is, is it stress is it learning kind of what is there a general typical theme that people are hoping to to use it for yeah and actually it's funny because i can tie this into free diving as well and because actually the components on how now i don't know about you um on how you trained in free diving but the, the way to, that I have seen the free divers train with breath control, the process is the same for anyone, regardless if you're a free diver or you're a secretary at a corporate company. It's the same, same thing. So what you're doing is you're overriding your nervous system. You're building up strength to your nervous system. So regardless, I get people that um have uh adrenal fatigue a lot of people that are dealing with burnout and a lot of my focus and my work is stress um breathe with steve which is my website and my business um it focuses primarily on stress and how to biohack your nervous system so and with soma i teach their mentoring program their coaching program because i know um the techniques and the science behind it so well that i teach them how to embody their gifts their strengths and be able to teach this kind of thing to others so the 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 diversity is huge. You got people that are dealing with fitness and peak performance, people that are dealing with traumatic experiences, people that have dealt with, um, again, burnout, uh, I mean, horrible, bad relationships, um, injuries, um, dealing with health conditions, chronic autoimmune diseases, all of which are coming um, to receive um, guidance because, again, the research that's now coming out is just profound. But the way that I can tie this together is there is a, it's called Nishisha Urshaka Kumbhaka, okay? And this is breath retention. This is a Sanskrit word, Indian Sanskrit word for breath retention, Nishisha Urshaka Kumbhaka, okay? This is holding your breath out and it's holding your breath out past the comfort zone. So that's the, that's the, the Nishisha. Okay. Rishaka Kumbhaka is just holding your breath out, but then there's this urge to breathe. Okay. This panic sensation, which again, we talked about is actually not a lack of oxygen, but a buildup of CO2. Anyway, what happens is you trigger your nervous system, the nervous system, because I, I want you guys all to think about this. When have you ever consciously on purpose held all of your breath out? It's just not common unless you are training in free diving or pranayama. But for me, I spent 30, yeah, 30 years of my life. And I don't think I'd ever, ever held my breath out. I've held it in when I'm swimming, when you're playing um, games to see who can do it the longest for between your friends, whatever. But when you hold your breath out, that trigger response that activates your nervous system. Okay. And this feeling of, Oh my God, I have to breathe. It's a panic sensation. So the Nishisha Rashaka Kumbhaka is overriding that urge to breathe, okay? And when you do that, your physiology starts to change. Your blood, blood vessels dilate. You start to produce more red blood cells. And what you do is you build up a strength to your nervous system. 
So it's really, really hard to build up resilience and strength to your nervous system. But one way to do it is your breath because your breath directly influences all the functions in your mind and your body and more precisely your nervous system. So each time that you train and holding your breath out, you're building up a resilience to that response, that panic sensation. Okay. That's why these free divers are able to, um, withhold that panic sensation and be able to override the thoughts because the thought sends a signal to the body. It said our diaphragm stopped moving. You stopped breathing red flag. What the hell's going on here? And the body starts to freak out. And same thing. If you're in a sauna, the heat, eventually you're going to start to panic and you want out, but it's just the mind sending a signal to the body because the nervous system is weak. It's overreacting. Okay. So the more you can train in holding your breath out and triggering that response to your nervous system, and then you override that response, you hold it just a little bit farther. Each time you do it, it's just, I, I literally say it's like taking your nervous system to the gym. Okay. Because again, you go to the gym, you lift weights. The next time you throw two and a half pounds on, you lift some more, or you increase the amount of reps or whatever it might be. And you build up strength. Same thing applies to your nervous system when you use pranayama or more, you know, Nishi Shudder Shaka Kumbhaka. And so this is overriding that signal that's being sent from the brain to the body. So again, whether it's um, a free diver that needs to stay very, very cognitive and very calm and relaxed under great pressure and, and, and very stressful environments, one way to do that is to build up a strength by holding your breath up. Okay. Mary Sue at her desk at the corporate job that's dealing with her boss yelling at her and she's got stacks of paperwork and all this stuff. That is the same stress response as the person free diving because stress is not real. It's a response. I can't, if I were to ask you to go get me a bucket of stress, could you? No, because it's not a tangible thing. <laughs> you could tell me you could go put your boss in a bucket and bring your boss to me, but like, like good one, mm -hmm. but it doesn't quite apply. It's a response. So whether or not you're sitting at a desk and your boss is yelling at you or you're seven meters underwater, you're, you're dealing with a stress response. The important thing is that we gain resilience and strength and override that stress response because that stress response is what keeps us in our little glass box, in our comfort zone. Mm. And when we can expand out of that, that's where we tap into peak performance, more possibilities, capabilities of what truly lies with inside of ourselves. So when Mary Sue at, the, at her desk is training in pranayama and holding her breath out and training her nervous system, when boss slams a huge stack of paperwork, gives her a her for it, it's not a big deal because her brain is conditioned to override that initial response, that stress response. And her physiology is also built it up. So now she's connected the mind and the body and she's built up a strength to that situation. This is one of the biggest things that I see with people that come in um, is that they build up a resilience to stress and stressful situations. And when you learn that stress is actually everywhere in anything, and it's not real, it's a response and you can override it, then this changes the demographic completely. So really the people that are coming into SOMA, let me tie this all back around, um, regardless if they're dealing with healing conditions, um, chronic um, disease, chronic pain, if they're dealing with wanting to reach peak performance, emotional pains, traumatic experiences in their life, depression, anxiety, all of it can be um, strengthened and brought back to balance by forms of pranayama like this. So it's diverse in that way. Now, how I present that yeah. routine is gonna be different for each person, but overall, this is one of the most important things to your health and your well being. And I haven't even touched the surface of how amazing this stuff is and how it affects your physiology. But this is a really, really powerful um, breathing method that I highly recommend people do. Yeah, a lot of what you're saying really resonates, actually. Um, number one, I'm, I'm very into the science of stress. Big fan of... Um, yes! Of, you know, so the, the, you know, the ulcers and all the rest of it. Um, just, you know, before we, we've got to go to that hell of a conversation. Um, recently, because I've had a knee injury, I have been just kind of conscious about 
using my transfer dominus, the, that lateral band muscle. And if I were to just, you know, I've not been practicing breath work that much lately, but if I was to just breathe, get in the power focus on holding breath in, I could probably sort of lay down and hold my breath for over four minutes or something like that. I've been doing stomach vacuums and focused on, on basically tensing my transverse abdominus. And it's shocking. I probably go about 15 seconds. And just that, that difference. And it's a very different intake of breath I take afterwards. So if I was to hold my breath in afterwards, I would I very calmly breathe in. When I do the stomach vacuum and focus on, on you know, flexing that TVA and then maybe playing around my abs, the breath in is, it almost surprises me the, 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 the level of panic that's there. I'm going, <gasps> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like being, being given the old, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. the shots. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Yeah, it surprises me when it comes in. And I mean, I'm talking about this, I, I've been doing this a matter of days now, probably less than a week. But what you were saying, the difference between uh, my perceived level of physiological stress from keeping the breath out as opposed to breathing it in is totally different. It's worlds and worlds and worlds apart. And the, it, you know, it, it is something that, that is very interesting because I always feel understanding the, the stress response that it would be something I would innately have decent control of. But it was new and different, and it got me. <laughs> <You Yep. know? laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and this is actually really cool. This is a little tidbit that anyone watching this can use. There's a couple of ways that you can gauge not only your health, but also your oxygen efficiency levels, how well and efficient you are at using oxygen. Because if you're not, you're putting stress on the cells, on your mitochondria, the whole nine yards, and it can be very damaging. Uh, but one way to tell is all you do is breathe all of the air out and hold. So actually, let's all do it right now. So just take, um, just remove all the air from your lungs. Um, one thing you can do is make a sound at the end. If you do a sound at the end until you can't do that anymore, that's going to help remove any remaining air that's stored in your esophagus. So do it and see how long you can hold your breath. Okay. So everyone just try it right now. Exactly. You just observe yeah. this. So this is the interesting thing. If you are at about 10, 10 seconds to 15 seconds is um, pretty normal, but it's weak oxygen efficiency. If you can do that for 30 seconds, then you have good oxygen efficiency. 45 seconds and up and you're rocking. You're rocking. Now in SOMA, we teach you how to prime the body to hold your breath out for longer, for like two minutes. And when you train in this long enough, you hold your breath out for two minutes. But one way to gauge your oxygen efficiency is if you can hold your breath out without anything else for 30 seconds or more, you're doing good. Anything less than that, and you need to train in more pranayama. Another one is how long you can hold your exhale. So like a tone. So you take a deep breath in. Oh. And you just hold that all as long as you can. And the longer you can hold that, the more um, efficient you are at using oxygen because you're removing that air slowly. And when the body is used to, um, adapts to having less oxygen, it adapts to using oxygen more efficiently. So those are just two little tidbits that people can use to gauge your oxygen efficiency level and also your overall health in your body. Tip yeah, that's awesome, Steve. I, I love stuff that you know people can can obviously just try straight straight away at home and start gauging their own kind of level where they're at with this. Essentially, what we did the first time there is is similar to the bulk test, isn't it? Where whereby you would actually be looking for that first 
initial panic response, aren't you, at the bulk test? You're not timing the length of time that you have that you can hold the breath out before you need to breathe. You're timing the time between the full exhalation and then that burst. Uh, it's like the diaphragmatic spasm, isn't it? Like the panic response to want to breathe again. But I haven't heard of the uh, the measuring of the tone. That's quite interesting. Is that a soma thing, or is that something that's yeah, okay, yeah, cool. We, yeah. Focus, we focus a lot on toning because that has profound effects on your vagus nerve and your vagus nerve runs through all the organs. So it's a great way to become mm. very parasympathetic and um, it sends a just soothing vibration to your mind, your midbrain, mm. your body, physiology. It's quite amazing. And you know, yeah. guys, also keep in mind, don't judge yourself on how long you can hold your breath. Remember, you don't usually do this unless you train it. So it, don't be surprised if it's 10 seconds. Also remember that a lot of it has to do with your environment. So us three sitting here, you know, in a very kind of um, nervous, excited type of environment, we're already sympathetic. And so holding your breath out in this type of environment is gonna be more challenging than it is if you're sitting lying down on your bed in your bedroom with soft music playing and you just try holding your breath out. So try not to be too hard on yourself. Remember your environment yeah. has a lot to do with this as well. I think that's a great juncture to go into a little bit of kind of why, or the, the main benefit for me personally of, of of why we're doing this in the first place. Because you know, nothing, no one practice is a panacea for everything, but breath work almost is because it's going to be benefit you on some level. You know, it's breath control exercise. We know the people at home won't necessarily know, but I've seen studies that have showed benefits for sleep, benefits for. Um, relaxation, you know, benefits for sports performance. So almost whatever it is you're interested in improving, some kind of breathwork practice is, is going to benefit you. But, you know, one of the best things for me to use this as a tool set is switching between those two states of nervous system. So the, your autonomic nervous system, as you mentioned there, you know, one side of it is that sympathetic nervous system where we're in this state of high alert, this state of readiness, fight or flight fight flight being the, probably the most common term that people use associated with that. And then obviously the, the, the other side of that is the, the parasympathetic nervous system, as you alluded to, when we're laying in bed, we're nice and relaxed, we're with our friends, you know, we're chilled. Then we're in that state of rest, that state of relaxation. And, and essentially what, what is typically happening with these breathwork practices is that we are initiating the parasympathetic state, aren't we? So it's a great tool set to switch from that state of high alert to that state of relaxation. And it's I've heard it being kind of quoted by many um, of the kind of influencers in this space as being the single most effective tool for daily use that, that you can use to do that. Um, and, and it's the great thing is that we're breathing anyway. So you know, in terms of tool sets that you can use at the, literally at the drop of a hat within any environment, you know, to just take a couple of minutes to be consciously aware of your breath uh, and to do something a little bit different with it, as you're talking about in line with kind of soma and, and many of the other practices, uh, prolonging that exhale. I mean, that's something that you can do anywhere. If you're at work, if you're Sally at work, having a boss screaming at her, you know, you can stop for two minutes and you can do that. You know, if you're in a social environment, let's say you're a socially anxious person, you're in a new environment and you, and you feel that stress response starting to kick in, you can take yourself away. You can do it while you're, while you're in conversation. You can pay attention to your breath and you can use it as that, uh, as that tool set to move between these two states. Um, and then great, that's uh, what I love about the, the tone, the me measuring the tone, marrying it up with that vibration. One of the reasons why I uh, hope, hope you'll agree with me on this, Steve. <laughs> One of the reasons why the breath is helping us to engage that uh, parasympathetic nervous system is because it's um, it's stimulating the vagus nerve, isn't it? So the vibration also helps with that. The vibration ties in with that. And again, another reason why we're finding out now or within the last however many years um, that these, these yogis actually are into, you know, they're onto something with the, with the, the chanting, the mantras, because it's the actual vibration itself. You know, it's not the magic in the words. It's not the, you know, the, the energy. I mean, it could be, but, you know, it's not necessarily crazy voodoo, you know, energy streams going on around us or whatever. It's the vibration that's triggering that, uh, 
um, relaxatory response that we have when the vagus nerve kicks in uh, and all that good stuff. So yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the you know the sympathetic nervous system there and and opportunity to give a quick explanation of kind of what's what's really going on there. Yeah. Man. Um, so uh, again, like bite-sized things that people can take away with them. Have you got um, some good tips for people that are not doing any kind of breath work already to get kind of started in this space? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and one thing before we go into this too, um, what you said was really, really spot on. One of the best ways you can become parasympathetic is to breathe. But I want you guys to know that you can handle both. So your breath can increase and actually bring you to be very sympathetic to the point that it's dangerous. This is generally why people are becoming ill and having sickness is because they are so dominant with their sympathetic nervous system that the body becomes fatigued, immune system becomes weakened, the cells start to break down, and now you're susceptible to disease. So um, a lot of breathing methods I know I'm going to make a bold statement here, but like rebirthing, holotropic breathing. If you do not know the foundations of pranayama and the proper way to breathe, those methods are teaching you the incorrect way to breathe. It's fine for a session, for a ceremony every once in a while. But when we talk about pranayama, we're talking about daily breathing and breathing practices that are going to optimize your health and your well-being. So guys, don't think that just by breathing, you're becoming parasympathetic. I just want to make sure there's a lot of clarity in that. Incorrect breathing is very, very dangerous to your health. It very much is. So it's actually about becoming less sympathetic and more parasympathetic or the balance between or the conscious awareness that you are sympathetic and that's okay in that time, but then you allow yourself to restore. You bring balance back, homeostasis back to the body. And this is allowed when you become parasympathetic, which you can do through your breathing. So I just want to bring a little bit of clarity on that because it's very, very important. Um, a lot of people have traumatic experiences from certain breathing modalities and techniques, and it's because it literally fries your nervous system and creates such a contraction that people have these big releases. So I want you guys to understand that's not necessarily all of what pranayama is. There's much more to it and there's much more diversity in it. So I like to try and um, break some of those stigmas that I've seen from a lot of people that have been traumatized through other uh, modalities. So anyway. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so one way to start. Um, really, there is this beautiful combination that is going to be so beneficial for basically anyone and where, where they stand. This is just an entry level, amazing way to start. And it's what we call the daily dose, okay? This is a daily routine that you can use that is going to bring you into elevated states of health, 100%. And we just did a recent science study. If you guys want to hear about it at all, let me know. But it was amazing. We brought people in and had all of them do 20 minutes. That's it. The daily dose is a 20-minute breathwork meditation. And each person had profound effects because they hooked them up to a brain scanner and they were checking their brain waves and the brain activity. And it was outstanding. The results, absolutely outstanding. But anyway, that is what I would recommend is people start with that. And what this is, is a, a period of time that you're going to do rhythmic breathing. So like I talked about at the very beginning, in through the nose, out through the mouth, and you're breathing in a rhythm. So in for two, out for four. This is going to be more calming or in for four, out for four. This is going to create what's called coherence. This is a really good optimization of your physiology is when you're coherent. And so what you do is you do about five minutes of rhythmic breathing. So and after five minutes, then what you do is you remove all the air from your lungs. So like we did. Okay. But what we've done is we've created a harmonization in the body. So that helps us to hold our breath out for longer. I won't go deep into that because there's a lot of different rhythms that have different effects, but basically after your rhythmic breathing, you then hold your breath out. You hold your breath out for as long as you possibly can. You override that urge to breathe. And then you hold your breath in. You take a deep breath in and hold, and you use your pelvic floor muscle. And what happens is 
through this, you rise up this energy. And again, there's a cascade of health effects that are generated from this practice. That is one round. A daily dose is two rounds of that. Again, 20 minute breathwork meditation. This is a phenomenal way to get back into a, a peak state of health. Actually, there's a, one of the uh, co-founders of Soma. His father has a very rare muscle deterioration disease, and it took him into his 50s to figure out the doctors to figure out what it really was. And you'll have to excuse me. I don't remember the, the scientific name of it or the diagnosis, but nothing was working. And they said, look, you're just going to wither away. You're going to wither away and you're going to die. So he had nothing left to lose. So he started doing um, his son. His son is the co-founder of, of Soma, and this is his father. So he got his father to start doing just the daily dose breathwork meditation. Well, literally in six months, he went back to the doctor and the doctor said, we cannot believe it, but your muscles are actually doing the opposite. They're regenerating themselves. They're rebuilding. And the thing is they figured this out because his father couldn't hold his son's one-year-old child. He couldn't pick him up. He was so weak. And after six months of doing this, they went to go visit their dad. And sure enough, dad grabbed the son and was holding him up and, you know, swinging him and all this beautiful stuff. And they went, oh, my God. And, and even the dad was like, oh, I can't believe it. So that's when he went to the doctor and found out his muscles are actually coming back. So this is just one small example. I, I have a laundry list of them. But I highly, highly recommend that you guys get on um, a daily pranayama, soma breath, breathing routine, doing the daily dose. And if you guys want, I have a really cool master class um, that talks about stress, the effects of breathing on stress. And it also has a daily dose breathwork meditation at the end of the master class that you guys can have um, for free or anyone that's watching this. It's my gift for me to you. That's awesome. Yeah, I really appreciate appreciate that, Stephen. Any um, any resources that you've got? Any references? Because I know that the guys uh, in our tribe like to to brush up on a bit of the science and stuff as well. So any references that you've got to stuff that either Soma is doing or that just backs up, you know, any of what you've said, feel free to send that over to me and I'll I'll add those to the notes and things as well. So yeah, mate, it's amazing how fast an hour goes by. We haven't even really begun to dig deep. But um, this has been amazing. I've got tons of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, right, I, think guys, I really forward. like these questions, man. Um, we might have to, uh, you go for your question if you want. We might have to open up a, a, a round two, like a second. We might need to do a series on this because I, I think with your guys' knowledge and uh, me bringing a very interesting topic um, together, we might be able to go really mm. deep on this and people might enjoy it. So, but what was your question, brother? Yeah. Um, it, it was more an observation. I, I was thinking in terms of life, uh, what both of you were saying, Cameron was saying, um, and yourself, that with regards to that um, juxtaposition between this sympathetic and parasympathetic tone, so basically for, for the layman, states of arousal, often in sport and sometimes in life, you think that you've got to get charged up and you know, you've got to get into this state of arousal to attack life or to attack the sport. I come from a combat sports background and my interests are things like free diving and spearfishing and archery and, and shooting and these kind of things. In combat sports, there's a degree you're going to get aroused anyway. You're about to get into a bloody fight. You, you, your, your, um, your, your physiology is on the line. My mm. coach used to tell me, if you can perform in the ring or in the cage at 40% of what you can do in the gym, you're doing quite well. You're doing really well. And what that means is it means you're containing and controlling yourself and not overextending and not trying to hit too hard and jump too far and make these, these mistakes. So there's almost this balance. Of course, you need to be aroused. But in those moments in the, in the corner, you're actually trying to bring your level down to stop yourself from making terrible decisions or overreaching and getting caught out. Sports like freediving where you go down on one breath or spearfishing or, or any you know archery or shooting it's totally the opposite to pretty much every other sport the point is to actually bring your level down and i think these are uh, analogistic to life like almost the rhythms throughout the day so when you know uh, i can't remember the, the the name you use but you know sally's at work and the boss says you know your deadline's due and you get that, you know, adrenal dump and that sharp cortisol, you know, your stress hormones go poof, 
in much the same manner as if she was Sally Jub Jub the cave woman and, and she <laughs> went into a cave and there was, <laughs> you know, like physiologically inside that state of allostasis, sorry, your, your um, balance, your endocrinological balance has just shifted in much the same way owing to perception. And the, the idea of consciously controlling that, uh, I, I think is absolutely fantastic and, and empowering. So I guess I guess these aren't questions; they're more observations of my, my own personal distillations of, of what you're saying, Steve. And um, I, I just think it's such a powerful tool to be aware and to almost standardize it, and to know what is happening internally as a response response to external stimuli. And it's at this point. You know, I, I don't want to sort of sound like a smart ass and, or, or take over, but I think we, just for the guys that are listening, we use words every day in life and they can have a multitude of concepts, uh, 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 contexts. And so one of the ones to help understand conversations like this is this old Hans Selye breakdown of the word stress, because we use stress in normally biologically, but sort of three different ways. And so we can talk about stress like, a stress or, which is something that happens to you. So say it got really cold or really hot, that's the stress or. That's stress, one term we use stress. Another term that we use stress will be my stress response. What physiologically happens in me to deal with it? So anything that changes my physiological state is a stress or. Any way I respond to it is also called stress. And then we use it in a third way, and that is the pathogenic effects of the stress response happening again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. <laughs> the chronic side. <laughs> it's, yeah, the chronic side. And that's when you say, Cameron, you don't look well slept. You're stressed. Or whatever. And, and I think um, for anybody listening, if, when you have a system in your mind that can make these things, it doesn't simplify, but it keeps it simple for you to understand. You, you start taking back control. And so not only do you have a perception now, but you also have techniques from guys like Steve. So you go, oh, I, I know what's going on. And that can be even more stressful. It's like, oh, these things are happening to my body. How do I deal with them? And I think that's the great power of just examining life and the world and your perceptions of it and bringing it down. So I guess what I'm doing is I'm giving you a verbal uh, line of my thoughts as I think <laughs> you get a stream of consciousness here is I'm trying to break down lessons that I can take away. We call this a brain dump. That's man. awesome. Yeah. You're bringing it out. And, and I want yeah. to add one word to what you're saying because I absolutely love your energy, your fire, your passion in this right now. I just love it. But you, you mentioned a word times. You kept saying bringing it down, bringing it down. And I want to bring a different word into context and it's harness. It's not about necessarily bringing down the energy or bringing down. It's about harnessing that energy. And you did nail a word that I love and it's control breath control. This is the difference between conscious breathing and unconscious breathing. And so there's a time that you want to increase your breathing. <sighs> You want to build up that flame when you're getting ready to um, go into like a very high intense situation or not really go into the situation to be able to um, thrive in that situation. But then there's the point where it goes too far and you start that flame becomes it burned to you and this is bad. So when you learn that there's a time to increase your breathing and that's okay, but you need to make sure that you bring it back down so your body can restore. And this comes from a different breathing. Okay, what about that space in between? Okay, well, there's a breathing rhythm for that as well. So I think you nailed it on the head when you said, really, kind of the, the, the sky is the limit and the, and the opportunities and potential is endless. But all you have to do is figure out the different breathing rhythms and methods and then tune it to the environment that you're in. Most people are a product of their external environment. And when you do this, you are giving all of your freaking power away. And this is most people in the world. Hey guys, you're not doing anything wrong. We're not taught these things, 
but you're giving your power away. When you start to focus on your breathing, this thing that runs on autopilot, and when you take conscious awareness, it's one of the only things that we have as humans that runs on autopilot, but also we can adjust and control it consciously, which is quite phenomenal. It's a miracle, really. And when you bring that control to your breath, you'll be just absolutely amazed how you can change the effects, not only before you go into the situation, but during and after, just by changing the way that you breathe. It's all about breath control. I love what you brought up, brother. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. I could do this that all is, day. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that, that's also a great point, Steve, that you, that you mentioned there, you know, that's, and that is one of the reasons why this is, it, inarguably, in my opinion, the most effective tool of switching between those uh, those uh, autonomic nervous states because it's the only way in which we're able to control an involuntary uh, bodily function through voluntary movement. And that's why we're able to bridge the gap so, so quickly and efficiently with breath. Obviously, with a bit of practice, and I, and I say this in almost everything I talk about, you know, Every modality, every you know, mindfulness, meditation, breath work, going to the you know, fitness in general, any sports discipline, they're all practices that we all get more efficient with them at, over time, you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, once you've once you've mastered it, then it without doubt is is one of the most effective tools, and, and that is that is pretty much the reason there that, that you mentioned just then. And between you two, you, you kind of led me on to something that I was hoping we, we would cover as well, um, which is kind of getting into flow. Because, Gaz, as you were talking about how, you know, the misnomer within sport that you always want to be charged up, you always want to be kind of fired up before you go into a, a fight as an example. But also we see, uh, I mean, probably powerlifting is a really good example. You see guys getting kind of slapped around by the coaches and sniffing the, the salts before they charge in and, and go for the uh, the deadlift PB or what have you. Um, uh, and that's a really interesting one that you're talking about, how actually, you know, maintaining that control is important. And Steve, you used a, a great word about harness. You're actually trying to harness, you know, the ability to control that environment. You're harnessing the energy in a way that you can still deliver it but that you're doing it in the way that's most effective. And essentially what we're kind of starting to talk about now is accessing that flow state where you, you're in the zone for, for anyone who doesn't know who's listening to this, we're talking about flow state, which is, is that feeling when you tune into an activity that you're doing uh, and that you are able to encompass that, that feeling that you can do it effortlessly, that you're enjoying every moment, you feel like you're, you know, you can do it forever and you're just doing it perfectly, you know, and, and this is, um, you know, this is a state that we often hear about in sports, in, um, you know, art, like music production, uh, running, running is a very common one where people experience flow state, but also doing tasks at work, you know, if you're even in a meeting like this or on a call with a, you know, you're a sales guy on a call with a prospect and it's just the words are flowing out of your mouth and you're saying all the right things and the guy's, you know, you can feel, you can already feel him reaching for his wallet, you know, that's that flow state, right, it's all just going perfectly well. Um, but you can't access that state when you're stressed, when, you, when you're feeling negative stress, like when you're positive stress, yes. But when negative stress is getting the better of you, you're never going to access that flow state. And this ties in with, you know, even though flow state is something that probably not that many people are actively trying to access on a daily basis, you know, pretty much all of our poor behavioral reasoning comes from a, mo a lack of emotional self-control. Yeah, and so if you're using breath work, to kind of harness your ability to handle that, you're also giving yourself the opportunity to start accessing this, this flow state in more of the things that you're doing. And so performance is just, you, it's like an exponential, you know, curve because you're starting with just that emotional self-control, which is mitigating the chances of making poor decisions, whether it's, you know, not being motivated to do the exercise you know you should be doing or not being motivated to do a good enough job at work or, um, you know, making poor dietary choices when you know you should be managing your diet and lose weight, whatever it might be. It starts with that, but then the principles that you've applied in order to to successfully achieve that can then be used to 
skyrocket your performance in everything else that you do. And this, for me, is why this is such an awesome, exciting thing to be able to learn about and understand and, and, then, and then harness, as you put it. Well I went a bit sideways with my point there. Ooh. I'm not sure if that was where I wanted to end up. But. <laughs> no, you gave me chills, I think, three different times. So whatever. <laughs> that, okay, anyone that's watching, that was a flow state. That was pure passion, excitement, and flow. And I love that you talk about that, man, because I'm an advocate for flow state. And that's the thing. It, it's the same thing, guys. We're, we're just like a car. We're just like a car. If we don't have good oil... Um, if the car's not running efficiently and well, and it's going to start to break down and stress stressors or a stress response, it's having your foot on the gas pedal and your foot on the brake pedal at the same time. And it's going to break down. It's going to, it's going to start to chuggle up, you know? And so when you can use these methods, you're doing exactly what you said. Kenny. I just absolutely love that. You want the infamous flow state that everyone wonders about. The thing is that we're taught to push, to go farther, go faster, go harder, push, get it done, get to the top. It doesn't matter what it takes. No. That's that's mm -hmm. burnout. That's burnout. When has anyone ever made a really good proper decision when you're pissed off, you're stressed out, you're sad, you're frustrated? No, I say take a step back and tune into your breath and your breath will balance the functions of your body, your physiology, everything. When Everything's working together and your thoughts are going to be clear because you have coherent breathing. So you're going to have coherent thoughts. Now you're tapping into your endocrine system and this breathing methods are going to start to release feel good hormones. So now you're almost in a sense manufacturing your own happiness. So you're clearing up your thoughts, you're optimizing your physiology and you're tapping in to literally um, the hormones and the transmitters that make you feel good. That is the effort of flow state. Now you mix in fitness. Uh, good eating, nutrition, other things like that. Guys, I'm telling you that you'll be unstoppable. This is how the ancient rishis and the, the ancient Himalayan yogis and the shamans, this is why they were they were said to be able to be immortal. They were living for uh, well over 100 years. They were optimized mental, physical, and emotional health. That is flow state. And I'm so glad you made a little left turn there, Cameron. You just touched it. I got chills because I love that word, flow state. I love it. Anyway, mm. Okay, I'll pull back. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I mean, this could just go in so many directions. Um, I'm conscious that I don't know how much more time you've, you've got, Steve, this round, but we can for sure. I love the idea that you, that you mentioned earlier. I, I was thinking the same thing. You have to talk about your telekinetic powers as well because you read my mind when you said. Uh, maybe we can do like a series and, and have another couple of rounds on this um, because it's just too it's just too big a subject to get into any real specifics in um, in go I think. And if we go off on too many tangents and it'll lose its, um, its clarity, so let's let this soak in for everyone. Um, this was huge, mm. you guys. Let's schedule this again. We'll go into a different topic. Um, you know, whether that's uh, more of the mental side, the emotional side, whatever it might be. Um, but I would love. to you guys and uh, any of these followers because this was a powerful conversation you guys are really really smart and i can tell very very good at what you do um cameron i know you and i know your background so but um you know I, i'm sorry what is it gary yeah, Gar what, yeah. What, yeah. <laughs> yeah i just feel like uh, you guys are uh, well diverse in what you do so it's uh, yeah it's been a pleasure chatting with you guys thanks yeah um, I'm sorry? Yeah, definitely. Really informative, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was looking forward to having you, Steve, just because I know you're so passionate about this. And you are you are one of the few people that I've come across that can readily back this stuff up with, um, you know, the, the science-based stuff, the evidence-based uh, stuff as well, which is which is what really people, that people need convincing because it's really important. You know, it's critical to health, this stuff. Um, and uh, and they do need that bit of extra reassurance, and it's not enough just to ask people to put their faith in, you know, thousand-year-old practices without kind of having more than a woolly explanation as to why it works. So, um, yeah, it's been awesome having you on, mate. Really, uh, really happy about that. Gas, you want to go? Any notes to part on there? Any questions that you've been of keeping course, in your back pocket? <laughs> 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 You know what uh, maybe if we do it again uh maybe as a premise 
uh, for, for the next talk, or maybe like uh, something to open it up. With my kind of students and followers, when people come uh, on the fitness retreats and even on the safaris and things like that, it's this fitness bent to it. Uh, we often think of health and wellness in three different factors, and we think of um, diet, movement and exercise, and lifestyle. And my big thing is lifestyle supersedes diet. Lifestyle is at the top of that hierarchy, even with movement, because lifestyle, if we want to put it in a scientific sense, is basically hormonal management is, is the basis of this, which is much of the same as you saying in terms of the breathing. Breathing is a technique to adjust your physiological state your emotional state, your emotional state affects your physiological state, vice versa. Yeah. And in that sense, lifestyle supersedes everything. I'm calling it lifestyle. And you could eat the most amazing diet, but your nutrient uptake will be absolutely dictated by your emotional state, which affects your physiological state. Same with your physical training. That is the stressor. But the time in which you adapt and do what we call in sports science to compensate is affected by your, your rest. And when I say rest, I mean it as a physiological state that you get into, not just stop what you're doing. Because I can stop what I'm thinking that's physically a stressor, but still have many mental stressors, which stop me from getting into a parasympathetic rest and digest, you know, the feed and breathe, whatever you want to call the, the, the state. And which stops me from, from building uh, and building upon it. So you often find that there's these people who do everything wrong. You know, they do the wrong exercises and they eat the wrong diet and yet they're, they're lean and healthy. And when you meet these people, they're also very happy people or at least contented and balanced in themselves. And on that note, I think that would be a great thing to start on just as a premise to talk about how does lifestyle supersede diet how does lifestyle supersede movement and exercise because it's at the for me it's at the top of the tree and for so long it was seen as this wishy washy esoteric psychology based thing where actually there's a, a, a we now have hard and measurable evidence that if you say you're in a particular mood and you're being honest there's very tangible readable quantifiable and qualifiable results that we can take from it from whether it's brain scan and blood work and uh how you even just heal um so i'd, I'd love for us to to sort of end on that like, if people were to go like oh, shit lifestyle supersedes everything and then if perhaps because we already talked about doing this again uh that would be the the premise you know how does lifestyle supersede diet and exercise Man. love it challenge, challenge accepted Love it. <laughs> I do too. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Great idea, Gaz. Mega keen for that. So, uh, yeah, in that case, uh, Steve, let people know where they can find you, um, where you're at, if they want to check you out and see what, you, what else you're up to. Yeah, it's we'll actually, it uh, it's super easy. It's um, breathewithsteve.com. So Steve and Whitney or Breathe Perfect. with Steve on uh, Facebook, Instagram, or my website, breathewithsteve.com. Um, and I have a, actually I have a four week um, stress less breathwork program where I teach you how to biohack your nervous system, how to optimize the physiology to bring you into the symptomous flow state to reach that peak performance. And it's a very pragmatical approach. So anyone that's um, just wanting to start somewhere, this is a great way to start. And if you have any information or uh, need to gather any information, check out my website, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm all about community and I love chatting with people and sharing information. And um, so I truly believe community is the cure. And uh, so, yeah, I, uh, I, I feel very warm and welcome to be a part of yours. And you guys are always more than welcome to be a part of mine. And that's, uh, that's what makes uh, lifestyle make it, make it that much sweeter. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. Good stuff. Yeah, top man. That's great. You're definitely part of the Theseus Body and Mind Legion now, Steve. So uh, we'll see we'll see you here again. <laughs> Have an awesome day. Awesome. Guys, thank you again so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I look forward to chatting with all of you. Um, I have a feeling very, very soon. <laughs>
Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, have a great day, guys. Anyone who's watching who hasn't already uh, downloaded the Fitter Body Stronger Mind ebook, which is available for free, all the essentials on how to develop awesome fitness and a resilient mindset, make sure you follow the link somewhere in the description or the comments here to get a copy of that. And we will see you for another episode of this very soon. Awesome work, guys. Catch you later.